verse 15. 21, 15, Gospel of John. If you take notes, I've entitled, I've entitled it, Take It Personally. Take it personally. Thus saith the Lord. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Now, um, doesn't seem like there'd be much in here, but I beg to differ. In every single passage of scripture, there is much there. You just have to dig for it. But before we dig into this passage, let's bow our heads and ask uh, the Holy Spirit to uh, walk amongst us and to open our minds to it. Spirit of God, we do thank you for indwelling us, and we ask you now, as the preaching of the word goes out, that you would um, speak to every heart. I pray that uh, you would speak directly to your people, and I would just be the vessel standing here, Lord, and that you would uh, speak to every heart as it pleases you. And if there be one here today, Lord, who doesn't know Christ as Savior, we do pray that the preaching of your word uh, the, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the preaching of, of the word. And we pray, God, that that might be the case today for one who knows not Christ as Savior. We ask you, Lord, if you're willing, and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to help us leave here with a blessing from this message. Help us to put something in our, uh, use it to put something in our life or take something out and to share with another life. It's all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Take it personally. <clears throat> Our title this morning seems to go against all that we've been taught about how to handle life situations. I looked it up. I wasn't sure. You know, there's so many definitions of things today. I looked up, take it personally in the dictionary, and it says it refers to interpreting a remark or action as being directed toward you and you being upset or offended by it even if that was not the speaker's intention. That's what the dictionary says. For and they gave an example. I took it personally when he yelled at the class. In other words, a teacher yelled at the class and one individual in that class took that personally instead of it just being something for the whole class to understand. That's why as young people, we're taught by our parents not to take things personally. We have to grow up and things are gonna happen and just don't take them personally. Our, our dads usually teach us, sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. You grow up, you find that's not always true, but as a kid, it works. <laughs> and as adults, we learn that taking uh, our lives personally can also cause us a great deal of pain and discomfort. That's because taking life personally makes it very hard to forget or to forgive. It fosters insecurity, shame, and low self-esteem. Taking life personally causes distress, it causes depression, discouragement, and a host of other emotional problems that affect some people for the rest of their life. You probably know people like that, I do that they, something happened in their life, they took it personally, and they never got over it. And they live with it to this very day. And I dare say all of us have at some point experienced the side effects of taking life too personally. All of us have. That being said, that's all true in the, temp, in the temporal realm. In this world, that's true. Taking things personally isn't a good thing to do. But as you know, you are not only temporary creatures, you are also spiritual creatures. I dare say you are more of a spiritual creature than you are a temporary creature. And taking things personally in the spiritual realm is a good thing, it's not a negative thing. Here, the term take it personally refers to God's word being directed towards you, but you're not upset because you know that the author of the word loves you, so you take his word to heart. That's what it means to take it personally, spiritually. That truth 
is found in uh, that uh, the author loves you is found in uh, Romans 5 8 but God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us in other words while you and I were still in our sin while we were while we were counting the blood of Jesus Christ as nothing as unholy he loved us enough to send him to die for us and to call us into his kingdom and we also see that in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He loves us. He loves his people. And when it says in John 3, 16, just for the record, he's not saying the world. If you look it up in the original language, the word world is... Um, Cosmos, thank you very much, is cosmos, and it means creation, and that means that God loves his creation, and if you look up the word love in the original language, you'll see the number G, it's a G25, the G stands for Greek, the 25 stands for the type of love, it's a, it's a respect for, it's a concern for, and a G26 when God says that he loves you, that love is a G26. It infers an intimate relationship. So, uh, so um, John 3.16 is telling us that God has a concern for the world. So he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. He loves you. He loves his people. And not only does God love us, Jesus commands us to love him if we love him will obey his word. We talked about that in Bible study, John 14, 15. It's a command. It's not optional. It says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Simply put, if you love Jesus Christ, God, if you love him, then this book is a book that you'll run your life by. It's that simple. It doesn't say you'll do it perfectly. It says that that's your goal, which means that every disciple of Christ, each and every one of you sitting here that knows him as Savior, is commanded to take their spiritual walk, to take the Bible, and to take their relationship with God personally, take it personally. It's meant to be done that way. And I would remind you that Jesus wasn't talking uh, or speaking metaphorically. Now, unfortunately, that lesson has not been learned by most of the 21st century evangelical church. They haven't learned that. They think God loves everybody. He wasn't speaking metaphorically. He said, if you love me, and I mean you really love me, then you're going to be able to, to uh, follow my commandments, walk in my word, keep it. What Jesus is telling us in John 15, 4, is if you want to have an intimate relationship with me, God, you must take the scriptures personally. That's how you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Which means if you're in the furnace of affliction, Something's going on in your life. Take suffering personally. You do that for Christ's sake. Philippians 1.29, For it has been granted unto you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but you should also suffer for his sake, whether it's persecution or whether it's just things in your life. Suffering is a gift that helps you grow. We all know that. If you go to a gym, what's the, what's the motto? No pain, no gain. Same is true in the spiritual realm. If you're, not, if you're not practicing your faith and sometimes uh, suffering through your faith, you're not gaining anything. We should also take personally our prayer life. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 commands us to pray without ceasing. So we should take our prayer life personally. Take it to heart. Make it an important part of your day. It should be an important part of the day. You shouldn't even have to make it. It should just be there automatically as a disciple of Christ. And if you want to get through the, all the difficult situations in this life and bear much fruit in the process, you have to take Romans 8.28 personally and literally. All things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. According to his purpose. You're his purpose. He has a plan for every life. And so whatever happens in your life, know that it was put there for you. So even if, it's, even if it's a bitter thing, it's an opportunity, and God put it there to help you. 
So instead of looking at it like cod liver oil, you should be looking at it as something that tastes sweet because ultimately it will be sweet. I dare say you better take everything you do in the spiritual realm personally. I don't care what it is, everything you do, because you're going to be held personally responsible for all that you do now. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all be, uh, appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So you take God's word personally because you're going to be personally held accountable to it. Another reason God wants us to take uh, the Bible personally is because from the time we're saved to the time we go home to glory, guess what? Every single day, you're going to have to fight a spiritual battle. There's not one day that goes by that you won't have to fight a spiritual battle of some sort, either against the world, against uh, demons and devils, or against yourself. But you're going to fight because you live in a sin-drenched world. Every day is a struggle for something. Every day there's a temptation. Every day. And if, you, if we don't take God's word personally during the, spirit, the spiritual battles of life, fear, which is really unbelief, right? Fear oftentimes makes us victims instead of victors. You don't, many Christians don't understand this. When you became saved, God gave you an armory filled with spiritual warfare equipment, and it's not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. He gave you that. He gave you the fruit of the Spirit. He said, I will fight for you. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That means on a battlefield of life as well. You have everything. In a, in, summed up, you have the opportunity to have a victory that in anything that comes into your life. You, you can be victorious over it. And the only thing that stops you from being victorious is yourself. That's it. Because you take God uh, personally, you take his word personally, you take, his, you take the promises of scripture personally, you have victory over everything. There's nothing you can't get a victory over. Victory over death. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, even death can't do anything. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? You have it. It's throughout the New Testament. Why? Because Jesus Christ had it, and you, and he's the vine, and you're the branch, so it, it dribbles down to you, so you have the victory. And 1 John, you have victory over the world, even your faith. That's given to you by God. You gotta take, you have to take your faith, you have to take God personally. The, the scripture, you have to take it personally. Take it to heart. That's what it means. Put it in your heart. Believe it. Live it. Speak it. Have a bibline bib language. That is what comes out of your mouth. I've had people say, how come every time you talk about something, it's always got a Bible thing in it? Well, that's because I'm a Bible guy. And I know the language. I'm learning it. Every day I'm learning something new. And you should as well. Don't be a victim. That dishonors God. When I talk to a Christian or a professing Christian, you know, I'll meet people. I meet a lot of people. And sometimes they'll say, well, how's the world treating you? Well, I'm hanging in there. I want to, you're a Christian, right? Yeah, you go to church? Yeah, okay. How come you're hanging in there? What does that mean, you're hanging in there? Well, things are kind of tough. But what happened to Romans 8, 28? Isn't that in your Bible? That that's going to all work out for your good, whatever it is? Is that, is that there? You have it? Do you believe it? Then you can't be hanging in there. I'll even tell you how bad it is. I was in a, in a, in a place, and I was buying something. And I walked in, and this was maybe a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks ago. And, <laughs> and I said to the guy, how you doing? I love doing that because I get so many reactions from people, and I feed on that. I love that. How you doing? He says, I'm hanging in there. Now, that guy was not, he didn't know anything about God, didn't want to know anything about God, right? I said, hanging in there. Oh, without even thinking, it came out of my mouth. I said, you know, I'm probably one of the most fortunate men in, in this store, maybe in this, maybe in this world. He said, what do you mean? I said, I don't ever have to hang in there because somebody hung in there for me 2,000 years ago. The guy started laughing. He never stopped. 
He laughed while he rung up my register. He laughed when he, when he gave me my product. He was laughing when I left the store because it struck him that he knew exactly what I was talking about. Now, whether, whether God used that or not, I don't know. But I know this, I'm, I don't ever, I can't recall ever being a victim since I've been saved because I dare to believe what's in this book. And you should be the same way. There's no victims in heaven. There's only, there's only veterans. That doesn't mean you don't get beat up. That doesn't mean you don't have scars. It doesn't mean that. It simply means that you finish whatever it happens in your life and you are victorious over it because in some way, shape, or form, you glorified God. And in the process, you sprouted up a little bit spiritually. Now, take Peter from our text. Peter was a victim. He was a victim of fear. And because of that, it drove him to deny Christ three times. This is somebody that ate with him, that slept with him, that watched him, that watched him bring back the dead, that watched him give sight to the, to the blind, put the legs back on the lame, and, and, and even give the, 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 those who have lost hearing their hearing back. He witnessed all of that. He saw it all. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He heard God speaking down. He saw all of it. But when he, when he was tested, he became a victim because of his fear, and he denied his Lord three times. To restore Peter, Jesus wanted Peter to take his question, do you love me personally? He wanted him to, to take that question. When Jesus said, do you love me? He wanted that, that question, he wanted Peter to say, take that personally. He wanted him to take it to his heart. Jesus asked that question three times because he had to reach all three levels of, of the human nature. There's three of them, the emotion, the intellect, and the will. Jesus, uh, <clears throat> and with that, the setting for this restoration to Peter took place on the shore of uh, the Sea of Ti uh, Tiberias. Now, when you, if, I'm gonna have you, if you should be there now in your Bible. The first thing I'd have you note is that our text and what follows, we know that Peter is established as the one who was given the keys to the kingdom. Because if you look at that, that passage, he's talking to Peter. He's not talking to the other disciples. And, he, and when he says, uh, feed my lambs, he's talking about the church. So Jesus, uh, but before he could be restored, Jesus had to first um, purge him from the guilt, the fear, and the insecurity that he that he had because of what he had, uh, because of his sin against his master. So Jesus, to purge that, asked him that question: "Do you love me?" And probably just as importantly than purging him from those insecurities and fear and guilt. It was also important that the other apostles that were sitting there with them see that the master had restored Peter from, uh, Peter from, the fall, from his fall from grace. They had to see that. They had to witness that. Now, the first thing recorded about Peter's fall is found in Christ's words to him before it actually happened. In Luke 22, 31 and 32, Jesus reveals, he says, Simon, Simon, behold. Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Remember the prayer he, he prayed for him? Now, it's important to note that Jesus didn't pray that Peter wouldn't fall. He didn't pray that Peter wasn't going to fall. He prayed that his faith wouldn't fall, uh, fail. His purpose is allowing Peter to fall was to allow the apostle to see the true condition of his heart. And isn't that what he did with Job? Exactly the same thing. Only by falling from grace would Peter understand the worldliness of his self uh, the worthlessness of his self-confidence. Only by seeing it. How many times have we done that? How many times have we sinned against God and we had to really feel that sin and look down and then look up and say, wow, I never knew that was there. I never knew I could do that. That's how we learn. Only by falling from grace would Peter understand his worthlessness. And only by falling would he be able, uh, would he be able to humble his proud spirit. He had, a, he had a proud heart. 
In Luke 22, 20, uh, 33, we see Peter's reply to the Lord and the necessity for Satan to sift him. Here's the reason why Satan sifted him. He said, Peter said, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. There's pride, right? A proud heart is a condition that not only exposes one to a fall, but the fall itself may be the only way to cure it or to cure a proud heart. The fall itself, when you, when you, after you fall, you look at what you did and you realize that, you, that there was something that had to come out and God worked that out. We must learn that Christ's power is made perfect in our weakness. That's what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. We must learn that we, when we are weak, we are strong. And that's 12, 10. You see, beloved, Jesus knew, he knew that Satan would torment uh, uh, Peter. He would tell him with suggestions, you know how sometimes things occur to us or speak to us and we, boy, that must be me saying it. It's spiritual warfare. Satan would suggest to him, you know, you, uh, your sin was so great. How could, you, how could you deny God himself? He's not going to forgive you. He knew that he would do that. The serpent would remind him that he lost his apostleship. You're not an apostle. Those other guys didn't deny him. You did. He would press home the idea that his hope in Christ was all but gone. He knew the devil would do that. To deal with these temptations, Peter needed his faith restored. That's what Christ was going to do. And that's why Jesus prayed that prayer, that your faith may not fail. Now look at verse 7. It says here Peter's told that it's Jesus who spoke to them. So what does he do? He's bringing in all this fish. <laughs> Somebody says, it, it's the Lord over there, it's Jesus. He puts his clothes on, because I guess when they went fishing in those days, they didn't wear clothes, they didn't want to soil them. So he throws his clothes on, jumps in, a, jumps in the water, and swims to shore. Now look at verse 9. We learn the first thing Peter saw when he joined the Lord was what? A fire of coals. A fire of coals. You know, that expression is found only one other time in John's Gospel. In John 18, 18, we read that the priest pa- there, in the priest's palace, there was a fire of coals that Peter stood beside with Christ's enemies warming himself. That's the only two places in John that it shows. It was here, and it was at that, at that point that Peter denied his master. So I think it's pretty fair to, to say that seeing his master standing by that fire of coals must have convicted his conscience. Imagine walking up on a beach and seeing, seeing the one you denied and seeing that fire of coals and knowing that you were standing by fire of coals when you denied him, and there he is right there. It must have convicted him, it convicted his conscience. It must have brought back a lot of memories of that denial. But you know what? When Jesus talked to him, you notice he didn't point it out. He never mentioned it. He didn't mention anything about it. And you know why? Because it wasn't necessary. The fire of coals was a silent preacher that said everything without ever uttering a word. Just just the fire of coals. Now look at verse 12. Here the Lord invites the seven disciples to have breakfast with him. Now here he begins Peter's restoration process. By inviting all of them to eat with him, Jesus demonstrated that his attitude towards Peter had not changed. He didn't say, okay, you six, you come over here, Peter, you, you go. He didn't do that. And he doesn't do that with you and I when we sin against him. He never leaves you, even when you sin. He may not hear you, because the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not hear me. He hears you, but he won't respond to it. He didn't leave Peter, and he won't leave us. With breakfast over, it's at this point that now uh, the Savior addresses Peter directly. Look at verse 15. He says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? You got to remember, he told, he told, uh, he boasted that he loved God more than anybody. Now he, Jesus says, do you love, do you love me more than these? Speaking to the other, uh, the other disciples. 
Now, I want you to note that he, when he started, he didn't begin with a reproach or a word of condemnation or even, why did you deny me? He didn't say anything. He just said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? The question is pointed directly at Peter's heart. That one question. We know that's true because the way, the way Jesus said it. He addressed Peter as Simon, son of John, instead of Peter. And the reason is because Peter was the name Jesus gave him. But he didn't address them by that name. Simon Peter, uh, Simon was Peter's original name that in John 1.42, Jesus said, you are Simon, the son of John, you shall be called uh, Cephas, which is translated Peter. Now, though, in speaking to him, Jesus refers to him as Simon, because in Luke 22.31, that was the name the Lord used in prophesizing uh, his fall, that Satan wanted to sift him. He called him Simon, not Peter. Luke writes, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. That's what he said. That's what he called him. So by addressing him as Simon, instead of Peter, the apostle would understand, Peter would understand that the origins of his fall did not come from Peter, the apostle, but from Simon, the natural man. Now, I want to tell you something. One of the things that always struck me when I first got saved, because I got saved late in life, is how in the world could all of this be true? And, and as I went to Bible college and I studied it and I read it, and I'm looking, for, I'm looking for anything that's disjointed, that's out of place, that doesn't belong there, that man-made or made up, something that just, there's nothing there. It's perfect even to the point of calling him Simon, prophesizing his fall, and then restoring him by calling him Simon again. If a man wrote this book without the inspiration of God, he wouldn't have made that distinction. He'd have messed up somewhere. Not one mistake. Perfect. By addressing Simon, him as Simon instead of Peter, Peter knew he would understand that his fall wasn't because from Peter the apostle, but from uh, Simon, the natural man. Peter's sin of fear, that's unbelief. Any fear is unbelief. Was the result of, re of reverting back to his natural state as Simon. Now, how many times have you done that and I, have I done that? How many times? How many times have we gone through our lives and, and something will happen and all of a sudden we get this dread of fear and we revert back to our natural state. That's exactly what Peter did. And that's exactly what we do. And Christ is still there to help us and restore us, isn't he? He's still there. He gives us a repentant heart. He tells us that I will cause you to walk in my statues. He helps us any way he can. I will fight for you. If God be for us, who can be against us? He's not letting you go. So when you sin against God, what you're doing basically is you're going back to where you were when he picked you out of it. In other words, we were all in the, in, the, in the mud pile, but when he calls you into his kingdom, he puts a new robe on you, a white robe. And because we still have our flesh that we have to fight against every day, and we have our lower will, which is choice, sometimes we make bad decisions. Sometimes the flesh wins, sometimes it doesn't. Read Romans 7. He talk, uh, Paul talks all about that. He said, why do I do the things that I don't want to do and I, and I don't do the things that I want to do? It's that fight I told you about. It's a civil war inside each and every one of us every day. And sometimes we go back to where we came from, that natural state, and we get ourselves all muddied up with sin. And that's exactly what Peter did. And that's why Jesus addressed him as Simon, Simon instead of Peter. In asking Peter, do you love me more than these? Jesus began to apply the perfect cure for his disciple. You see, Jesus didn't want Peter to lose, uh, to lose the lesson of his fall. He didn't want him to, he didn't want him, there's a lesson in every fall, isn't there? If you've 
whenever you sin, when you come out of that sin, there's a lesson we, you should be learning. And if you're not learning, you should find out why. Because if you, if you go back to your natural state for 20 minutes, 20 seconds, and then you come out and you have sin and you, and you, and you have a, a contrite heart and you repent that sin, there's some lesson there that you should learn. Besides, don't go back. There's another lesson. And Jesus didn't want Peter to lose the lesson of his fall, so he had to delicately reopen the cut by retracing Peter's denial. He does that by saying, do you love me more than those? Those words just reopened that cut because he told God, Christ how much he loved him and then he denied him. So Christ, just those simple words, do you love me more than these? That, that question had great meaning to Peter because in Mark 14, 29, he boasted, even though all may fall away, I will not. That's what he said. So when Jesus said, do you love me more than these? He was just gently cutting that, that little cut open so he remembered the fall. And not only, and not only was he trusting in his own loyalty, but he boasted that his love for Jesus surpassed that of the other apostles. That's why Jesus asked him, do you love me more than these? Now the question gave Peter an excellent opportunity, a gracious opportunity to retract his boasting, which he gladly took advantage of. He answered back, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. The word you know was Peter's heartfelt confession to his master of what he had done. And Matthew 26, 75 shows Peter's contrite heart for his sin. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So he leaves it to the searcher of the hearts, the one who looks into our hearts. He left it to Christ to determine his love. He said, you know. You see, Peter couldn't trust his own heart anymore because he thought that he would never leave him. He thought he would never deny him. So he couldn't trust his own heart. He left it to Christ. He couldn't trust his works in love anymore. So he appeals to Christ. You decide for yourself. You, you know my heart. You decide for yourself. And I want to just have you know something. He did not say, you know if... I love you, or whether I love you. He didn't say that. He said, you know I love you. You know I love you. Peter rested on the Lord's knowledge of his love. What a lesson that is for us, huh? Resting on the love that, that you have for God and he has for you. Opening your heart to him and resting on his love. And we rest on God's love in many different ways, and time forbids me from mentioning them, but there's just so many ways that we can rest on God's love. When you go home today, think about that. Think about how this coming week you can rest on the love of God. Just rest on it. Not work it, not, not anything, just rest. You know, the Bible does say, be still and know that I am, that I am the Lord. Rest, find ways of resting on God's love. And in that, we see Peter's humility and confidence when, uh, that he was united once again with his Savior. Someone has written on this passage. He said, and I quote, It was as though he said, Thou hast known me from the beginning as son of Jonah, drawn me to thee, hast kindled love in my soul, hast called me Peter. Thou dost warm, warn of my blindness and pray for my faith, and hast since forgiven me. Thou hast looked both before and since thy death into my heart with eyes of grace, so thou knowest all. What I feel concerning my love is this, that I am far from loving thee as I ought and as thou art worthy of being loved. But thou, O Lord, knowest that in spite of my awful failure and, not, and notwithstanding my present weakness and de deficiency, I do love thee. Rest in his love. See how that works out for you this week. Now let's look at the last section of our verse. Here Jesus responds to Peter. He said, after, he, after uh, Peter said, you know that I love you? 
Jesus said, he's, uh, feed my lambs. The Lord was so pleased with Peter's response that he not only accepted it, but he also gave him a commission. Feed my lambs. That's, it stands, the, the word lambs uh, gives the idea of the church, gives the idea of uh, feeble Christians in a church. Remember, this is the first church. They were, they were, the first church was really uh, 12 people. He told Peter, feed my lambs. Two more times after that, Jesus pressed the question to Peter, do you love me? And each time Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Three times. The last two challenges that Christ uh, spoke, uh, spoke to Peter about, it was spoke directly to his mind and his will. So he spoke to his emotion with the first, do you love me more than these? And the last two was for his mind, his intellect, and his will. And in every case, he said, you know that I love you. Peter denied the master three times, and the Lord challenged him those three times to get at it all. He did this to purge his conscience, to restore his faith, and to reveal his sin of pride. He, that's what he did it for. And he did this to give him the opportunity to confess his love of God and also do that in the presence of fellow disciples. You see, Jesus knew he knew he chose the right man to give the keys to the kingdom. He knew. Of course he knew. He just wanted Peter to renew the pledge of his love to him because he denied him. Now, as you know, I am an applicator. So the application to everything I've said is this. I think that if the Lord asks a disciple three times if he, uh, uh, if he loves him, he's teaching us that to love Christ above all things is essential to our discipleship. You and I are disciples of Christ, and we should love him above all things. We talked about that in our Bible study this morning, about the lordship of Christ. Maybe a new term to some of you, but it seems, simply means living for Jesus. There's a, there's a hymn about that. Also, loving Christ is the first and the greatest command, and without it, we are, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, a sounding brass or a tinkering cymbal. It's nothing but noise. I dare say Jesus asks every one of his disciples every day, Christ asks you and you and you and you and you. He asks every disciple, do you love me? Every day. He asks, do you love me more than your life? more than your hobbies, your sports, your family, your mother, your father, your children. Do you love me more than them? Your play, the, way you, the things you play with, your toys. Do you love me more than the internet or your telephone? <laughs> There's a, something to think about, more than your telephone. Do you love me more than the little kingdom of I? Self-reliance. Self-glory, self-absorption, self-importance. Do you love me more than those things? Do you love me more than the world? Do you love me more than money, glitter, or fame? Do you love me more than that? And most of all, do you love me more than sin, or the lust of the flesh, the ears, the eyes, or the taste? Do you love me more than these? How would you answer these questions, rhetorically speaking? Can you say with confidence, yes, Lord, you know that I love you? Can you say it like Peter did? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And do that knowing that he is a discerner of your heart. Take that thought home with you today. And if you feel convicted from it, then restore, renew, or rededicate your love for Christ. It's just that simple. You don't have to get upset. You don't have to get angry. You don't have to be discouraged. Just get over it and just rededicate your love to Christ. It's that simple. I have to tell you something. Again, I'm a, I'm a pretty new Christian compared to some of you guys. I can't tell you. Ten times, 15 times I rededicated my love. And by that I mean, you know, I started to feel a little weak in the faith. And I said, Lord, you got to help me. 
You know I love you. You know I want to serve you. So help me. I dedicate my life to you. And there was some junk in my life that was cluttering it up. I got rid of it. I got to tell you something. Throw away stuff is not human nature. I don't know why that is. We're junk people, really. We like to hold on to junk. <laughs> when you reach my age, though, guess what? You start throwing that junk away or giving it away because, you know, if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. So what you need to do is get rid of some of the things that keep you from loving God more than anything else. Do you love him more than these things? If you have a bulletin, I'd like you to turn to the back of it. I have a quote from John Piper. He says, there will be no people in heaven who want to be around their things more than Jesus. That's the point I'm trying to make. Do you love me? more than these things. Go home and think about that. And if you do, if you find in your heart that you really do, then rejoice, brother or sister. Just rejoice in the Lord because you're blessed. And then go on and share, share how you did that with another brother or sister and pass it on and help them to love God more than anything else. Take it personally. Take it to your heart. Let's pray. Father, we do, think, we do thank you for giving us a heart for Christ. We start off with that, Lord, but somewhere along the line, that, that seem, we seem to clutter that up. Pray, God, you would help us to remove the clutter in our life so that we could ask you to search our hearts and see that we love you more than these things we have around us. Help us, Lord, to always remember the first commandment, the one with the greatest promise of loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and body strength. Help us, Lord, to do that. I pray that, that um, if there's one here today who's feeling convicted by this, that you would strengthen them and give them the wisdom to find out what it is that they're holding on to more than you and help them to let go of it, that they might grab a larger part of you because Lord ultimately that's the thing that counts the most because anything we grab a hold of outside of you has no value at all in the scheme of eternity and that's where we're all headed thank you father we ask it with faith and we ask it in Christ's name amen